Yeah, the choir loft. Uh, yeah. Okay, here we go, and welcome back. <coughs> here you've got your your stuff, and um, we're going to work with it. So if any of you don't have it and you left it home or whatever, try to lean over with somebody or somebody that's in a row or next to you that can share it. And if you would uh, share your stuff with other people um, who may not have it, last week. Uh, we're also, in the same time we're looking at that stuff, and I'll refer to it as stuff because, you know, otherwise, I mean, um, we were looking at page 981 in the Bible, in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 9, and in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 9, um, there was a statement made by Paul, who is actually Apollonius or whoever wrote this stuff. And he was talking about, you know, the Old Testament stuff that we read about, the religion. Uh, remember, this is the same guy who said, get away from the um, Christ, um, what's the actual words? Doctrine, doctrine, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ. And then he's telling us here that these other things were just symbols. And he says in Hebrews 9, in verse 9, which were a figure for the time then present. In other words, a tabernacle and a temple were the figure of those, but there was religious things, gifts and sacrifices. But then he says, that could not make him that did the surface perfect as pertaining to conscience. Now I think uh, Gloria showed us this word too, which became very interesting when you, you break this down. And um, what we're doing now, we're walking hand in hand. The word con means with. And we're walking hand in hand with science, conscience, with science, because basically that's what we're, we're determining. That's what we're beginning to understand. And that other word that's very important there that is used in Hebrews 9 is perfect. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, there's no way that I can be perfect. Well, there is, because when the thoughts of the mind cease and there is nothing but this white void of nothingness, there is perfection there. So, anyhow, we then realize that it takes something else other than churches and religions and books and so forth and so on to get us to this point of perfection where there's a, there's a reason then for us to, to be able to become part of the, the plan. And part of the plan is for each one of us to learn how to use the computer that has been placed on top of your shoulders. If you reach up, and, you know, it's probably there. You'll find midway between your shoulders a round object, okay? <laughs> this round object is placed strategically there with all kinds of stuff in it. But one of the main parts of it is a computer. And it is a magnificent computer that is able to do things that there's no computer on the face of the earth at this point is yet able to do. The problem with this is, I know, I've got, a, I've got a computer home. How many of you have a computer at home? All right, that's a lot of people in a small room have a computer. What's the chances of you getting wonderful information out of that computer if you don't touch it? <laughs> you just go into the room and sit there and hope. <laughs> or pray, or claim, and I'm claiming the internet. I'm claiming the World Wide Web. And, and the screen stays blank. Nothing comes on. Absolutely. But this is exactly what you're told to do by the people who taught you in religion with your computer that God placed here right between your shoulders on the top. He said, and you're told by religious people, don't touch it. Now, how are you going to, how are you going to understand what God expected of you and what God has for you if you don't turn it on? You can't. So you've got to understand that. See. Oh, look at Hebrews 9.10, which he talks then about these, these rules, which stood only in meats and drinks and washings and ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. In other words, all of the religious rules and regulations and traditions, which when taken literally, mean absolutely nothing. And they're all a waste of time. What have they ever done for any? What has anybody ever accomplished? What has, ever, what has happened for the common good? But we've seen the deterioration of the earth and the cultures of the earth in spite of the fact that every culture of the earth has this great religion, which, which is absolutely worthless. Then we get to this point here. 
in verse 11, but Christ being come on high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. Ah, now, see, now you've got a tabernacle that's not made with hands, you have a temple that's not made with hands, and, and the only temple that you, can, you know of that's not made with hands, you can point to. If you take your finger and you point right there to the side of your head, that's a temple and it's not made with hands. And that's where all of this is taking place. And that's what's talked about here. Not made with hands. But look what it says. But neither by the blood of goats and cats, but by his own blood he entered into once the holy place, having obtained for us eternal redemption. Now the point is, we got this word blood again. And we have to say, well, is this the kind of blood he's talking about that when you stick yourself and it drips out or you cut yourself or when you, you, know, you slice your finger on a piece of paper or you know, all these things? Is this the kind of blood we're talking about? Because if it is, then we have this, this monstrous type of, 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 of power roaming through the stars that has this mania for watching blood drip out of people. I mean, this is tough stuff. What chance do you have? You're in, you live in Fork and River, and you got this thing roaming around wanting to see blood flowing and so forth and so on. And so then you'd say, well, gee, I, I, don't, I don't have, you know, I can't deal with this type of power. This is, a, this is, this is, this is violent. But go to page 942, and, and let's try to put that aside, because it says in page 942 in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50. Now I say this, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So that's, we're not talking about that kind of blood. We're talking about the Christ inner life force that is sacrificed, okay? So we've been all through this, we've talked about this, I've given you documentation of this, you've got all of this kind of stuff, you've got, you've got the word blood here in the thing and it describes what it is, it's the sacrifice of the inner life for But now let's get to the point. Then the point is, how is this Christ inner life force sacrifice? How? How does this happen? You see, the point is, you can go and you can read Buddhist books, you can read Hindu books, you can read religious books, you can read... Islamic studies, that the point remains, how do you do it? And nobody ever answers that. What happens? How is it possible? How, how is it possible for these things to happen? And what we've got to do now, we've got to move away from books, we've got to move away from religion, we've got to move away from symbols, we've got to move away from examples, and we've got to find what is it all about? How does this thing called Christ which is the high priest, go into the holy place and do all of this wonderful stuff. How does that happen? Is there a logical explanation? Is there an anatomical explanation? Or is this all pure symbolism? Okay. Now, let's start off by, by looking at something. And we'll look at, remember the temple is not made with hands. So we're looking at this. I mean, I think we have a right to assume that the temple that's being discussed here is the one that is our head, simply because this temple is not made with human hands. If we look at page 296, we'll look at the construction of the temple. Page 296, and it's 1 Kings chapter 6. 1 Kings chapter 6. And if you look at verse 7, there's several things about the temple that you'll find out concerning its construction. Okay? It was built of stone, made ready before, so there was no sound of hammer or tool. There was no sound. So the temple is made in silence. So obviously we can't be talking about any kind of a physical building. It's made in silence. Now, when we get into the anatomical study that we're doing about the human body, there are things that we look at and we say, what if this has any connection to us? The door for the, verse 8, the door for the middle chamber. Why don't you remember that one? The middle chamber. Okay. 
The door for the middle chamber is in the right side. Okay, and of course when we have the right hemisphere. And it went up with winding stairs. All right, winding stairs. And if many of you have been to the doctor recently, you'll find that, uh, oh, how do I do this? There's something like this. And <laughs> something like this? Yeah. Something like that. I don't know. But anyhow, I'm getting a little screwed. But interestingly enough, let me tell you something about that. That's a caduceus, okay? And you have a winding. When you follow this thing down, okay, you'll find there were three eights. There's eight, eight, eight made by the interwinding of these circuits, but we're not going to get into that right now. They go up with winding stairs into the middle chamber and out of the middle chamber into the third. What? Now remember, it's not a building. It's your head. It's the made in silence, the meditative part of it, we understand. It's the human body. And it involves a middle chamber, a right side, and something called the third. Now, what we've studied so far, and what we understand, that God's secret covered place has a name. And you have it on the very first page of the stuff that I handed out to you. And the name is cerebrum. That word is not pronounced cerebrum. There is a cerebral, this is cerebrum. How do I know it's pronounced the way? Because I have a talking dictionary, that's how I know, and they pronounce every word. And the guy, when this comes on, says, cerebrum. <laughs> Woo, that's what I wanted to hear, see? Because if he had said cerebrum, I would turn it off. But it's cerebrum. Now we just read that in 1 Kings 6, 8, in the right side of the house. The right side of the house is the east. The, west, uh, the left side of the house is the west. The south side of the house, excuse me, the bottom of the house is the south, and the top of the house is the north. The east, or the right side of the house, is the point where the by the trajectory of the earth, the sun is positioned in April when spring comes. So in other words, the same thing that happens in the head happens in the sky. So the sky then is the macrocosm, and the head is the microcosm. As it is without, so it is within. Also, there is another thing, those winding stairs that the Bible talked about a moment ago, where the energy goes up with winding stairs, is DNA. And I don't know, I don't have a picture in this particular one, but I gave you a picture one other time of DNA, and it looked just like a set of winding stairs. Winding stairs, and you'll also find the serpent motion, which is the energy which rises up the spine. But there's another interesting winding motion, and that is the ecliptic, where the pathway of the sun that travels where the, the 12 constellations of the 12 signs of the zodiac are positioned. Okay, now... When you were just looking at 1 Kings 6, 8, and it says it went up with winding stairs, in the middle chamber, and out of the middle chamber to the third, okay? Out of the middle chamber to the third. Now, the third is important, and let me show you one other scripture that deals with it. Um, and, and let's take a look at it, and, and we'll see an, a, 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 a description of an out-of-body experience in the Bible. Page 949, and 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And look at verse 2. And here is Paul speaking. I know a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether... Out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. To the third heaven. 
So we have the middle chamber, we have the third, and we have this guy having an out-of-body. Now, how do we know that he had an out-of-body experience? Because later in the Bible, he says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You see? So he had an out-of-body experience, and um, so forth and so on. Okay. Now, what we'll do is we'll take a look at Gray's... Well, let's leave this up here. So we have the middle and the third. Now, if you'll take a look at the stuff, and if you'll take a look at Gray's Anatomy on page 10, you're going to look at two things in particular. You're going to look at the middle chamber, which is the holy place, and it becomes obvious to you, and you can see the middle chamber. And then you're also looking at the third ventricle. And we're, we're going to then say, wait a minute here, is there any connection between what is being discussed in the Bible? We've already proven the thing about cerebim and cherubim. We've already proven the thing about dura mater, pia mater, and arachnoid, and about uh, the human brain and so forth. Now, is there any connection here? Because if there's a connection between this and this and the Bible, then we have something that's immensely significant. Now we have, a, we have a description of how the brain works, and then we start to break down the code, and we start to see the different clues, and it leads you to the place where you can push the button, and bingo, you turn the computer on. And then you soar into the World Wide Web big time. <laughs> and remember, the World Wide Web in your computer is the World Wide Web. In your brain, it's arachnoid, which is the web. And the universe has an arachnoid, too, which is the World Wide Web. That's the universal web. There's nothing that's out there that's not in here. And all of these things work the same way. Now, if you look at, I have the first line that I wanted you to look at, underline, the third ventricle. Do you see that? Is the cavity of the interbrain. The third ventricle is the cavity of the interbrain. The word inter means buried, it means covered. And remember that the cerebrum covers all of this and that the, uh, according to the scriptures in the Bible, it was the job of the cherubim to cover the holy place to cover the middle, to cover the center, okay? So just hold that page 10 open, and as you're looking at that, you see where it says the third ventricle is the cavity of the interbrain. The inter means covered. The word inter means covered. And these are things you can look up when you get on with the dictionary, but that's what the word means. Okay, now looking at that, I want you to take the Bible, I want you to turn it to page 68, and I want you to look at the book of Exodus. And you're looking at the tabernacle or the construction of the, the tabernacle or construction of the temple. And when you look there, look at chapter 25. And in chapter 25, verse 20, And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering their mercy seat, with their wings. And so their job, cherubim, as the same job, cerebrim, is to cover. To cover the center. To cover the secret place. Now, you got your papers, your stuff. Go right to the very first page before you get to anything. And if you look down in the center of that page, you see the word cerebrum. Now, I gave you a copy of the dictionary on the very first page, and if you look at that dictionary, it says Sere, C-E-R-E, to cover. To cover. So cerebrum, your brain, is to cover. Cherubim, the holy angels in the Bible, is to cover. It's the same thing. So it's not just a coincidence in sounding of the word. I mean, it's a definition. And then, of course, you also, as you looked on that very first page, when you look at cerebrum, it refers you to the word K-E-R, and it says ker, among other things, Capricorn, etc., and it also gets down to cerebrum. And then if you look at cherub, you see the root of Hebrew, K-E-R, K-E-R-U-B-H, and the root, uh, root of the ancient Babylonian, K-A-R-R-I-B-I-M. So the, the K-E-R, K-A-R, 
is consistent with the root of cerebrum, which is K-E-R, and both mean to cover. And the cherubim are specifically placed in the temple, which is the dura, pia, and arachnoid. So let's go. Now, the interbrain that, that is, is, is that the center place between, you know, and if you look at Exodus 25 where you are, and look at verse 22, and, I, and there I will meet with you, and I will commune with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims. Between the two cherubims. Now, you see, you see this picture. It's pretty obvious. And I'll show you the two, the two cherubims. There's one cherubim here, with one wing extends here, and the other wing extends here. And there's another cherubim whose one wing extends here, and the other wing extends there. Hitting the wall here, hitting the wall there, hitting the wall here, hitting the wall there, and their wings meet in the middle. And there's the two cherubim. Now, go to page 297 and we'll look at the construction of the temple so you know, we can see that again. In 1 Kings chapter 6, Take a good look at that cerebrum that you have in front of you, the third ventricle and the inner brain, okay? You got a good look at that. All right. Now, look at 1 Kings chapter 6 and look at verse 27. And set the cherubims, that's your cerebrum, within the inner house, inner house, inner house, in the center, inside of your head. And they stretched forth the wings of the cherubim, so that the wing of the one touched the one wall, and the wing of the other touched the other wall, and their wings touched one another in the midst of the house. So here then you have the wing of one touching one wall, that's your head, that's your skull, the wing of the other touching the other wall, which is your wing, which is your head, which is your skull, and they met in the center. Okay? And that's the cherubim, and that's the cerebrum. Okay. Now, if you see there in the very center is where all the good stuff is. The pineal gland's in there, the fornix is in there, and the fornix plays a very important part in this. You've heard about the stone rolled away, you've heard about the baby being born in the cave. All of that stuff happens in the fornix. When the stone rolls away from your fornix, that's when you fly. And you'll be able to do that. If you, if, if, if you, if you study, look. <laughs> It has always been a, a wonder to me with such a tremendous, powerful instrument as this universal computer balanced between your ears that people thought that they could activate all of this wonder inside of themselves by walking up an aisle and signing a card or saying, I do, yes, what? You do what? You don't even know what the heck you got there. It's like, it's like any of us going down to the motor vehicle and say, I want a license. Do you know how to drive? That's irrelevant. I want, just give me the license. You know, you have to know how to drive. Because we're not going to trust you on the road with a machine as powerful as a car unless you know how to operate it. And yet religion is totally convinced that there's some God who will trust them with this dynamo that is located on top of their head and they haven't a clue of how it works or what to do with it. No way. And you people are the first. And I know it's hard for you to conceive of this. You're in Fork and River sitting in the basement. I know it. I know that's where you are. How could you possibly be? You'll find out. But you are. You are chosen. An unusual group of people, as they say in the Bible, to understand this stuff. And you, you understand, and you will understand it. And then, and, 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 you know, every bit of it, and, the, and you get to such a, the, the, the description of it and the proof of it and all of this stuff is done, documented scientifically for you, and, and it's yours. And once you understand it, it's the same way. When you've taken your test and you show that you're able to drive the car, the guy comes in, he stamps your thing, there's your license. Wow, I got my license. Now I can drive a car. And you're going to get your license to roll the stone away or the fornix and then fly away. And be all of the things that God really intended this world to be. To simply learn about how he puts you together so that you can operate it, know what to do with it, and do it for the good of all of humanity and for this entire universe. Okay? The third ventricle is the cavity, the covered place of the interbrain, the middle house between the two wings of the cherubim. Now, if you look at this here, okay, and read with me, 
on, on your stuff on page 10, okay? It is between, it is a narrow, we don't know all of these words. Don't worry about all of these words. Just worry about the word. It is a narrow median crevice between the two optic thalami, which constitute the side walls of the interbrain. Okay? Now, remember something. Where did we find cherubim? We not only found cherubim in, in the brain in this particular way as far as the construction is concerned in the temple. We found them someplace else, connected with something beyond the human brain. But the same thing, the cerebrum, the cherubim. And just before we go on, let's take a look at it. Page 684. And in page 684, you come to our old friend from uh, Hangar 51 in Roswell named Zeke. <laughs> Ezekiel. And this guy was the first UFO character that ever lived, and he really did. He had a real trip and whatever. But the point is this. In Ezekiel chapter 10, okay, and Verse 15, well, let's go to 12. He said there were wheels. The, the, their eyes were full of wheels, even the wheels. As for the wheels, it was a wheel, and every one of them had faces. And the first face was the face of a cherub, the second the face of a man, the third the face of a lion, the fourth the face of the eagle. And the cherubims were lifted up. And this is the living creature that I saw. And it talks about the cherubims went, the wheels went, and when they stood, they stood. And all of these things happened. And they're, they're full of eyes. And, and so, in other words, we have cherubims who are connected with UFOs. I mean, this guy in the Bible saw an object. He couldn't identify it. And it flew. That qualifies it as an unidentified flying object. <laughs> he saw an unidentified flying object. But he, he called it, he said, this is cherubim. He identified it as cherubim, and cherubim and cerebrum are the same thing. And this means basically that when the cerebrum is activated, and we know that from the angles and the receptors and so forth, the electricity, it opens, it throws a switch, and the switch brings you to a frequency that you don't normally function on. And on the frequency that you don't normally function on, you can see the people, you can see the things that you normally can't see. That's all there is to it. It's no big deal. These are just people. There's no, I mean, would you, I mean, are you going to get all spastic because you see somebody from Australia? These are just people. There are advanced people in many instances. I'm sure some of them are not as far advanced as you are. It depends on the particular portion of the universe that they're dwelling in. I saw, you know, this funny to tell Albert. There was a big article in the Asbury Park Press, and they were talking about the millennium. The Earth is reaching the age of 2,000. <laughs> Only to the people on the Earth. Remember, it says in the Bible, how far away is God? When you get outside, you get into quantum physics. One every day is like 1,000 years. That means that last year was 365,000 years. Multiply that times 2,000. What's the big deal about 2,000 years? 365,000 years times 2,000. So, I mean, you know, it all it's all relative. It depends where you're looking at it from, you see. So here then we have cerebrum, we have cherubim, we have a realization that cherubim are also involved with this UFO thing so that it would raise your ability to see people and see things at a different frequency in the same way that you only used to be able to get up to channel 13 on your TV set. And then that technology improved, and you're now able to get up to channel 80 or channel 77 or whatever it is. And there's a whole bunch of stuff up there that you can see. If you only have channel 13 on your television set, and Larry King is God, you can't see God. <laughs> but when you're able to raise your frequency to this higher level to channel 48 or 28, whatever, guess what? You can see God. There's Larry King. But it's necessary for you to be able to raise it. And so this is what it's talking about as far as cherubim connection with this UFO. But the point that I wanted to bring is that it says the, their wings and the wheels were full of eyes round about. And the third and the optic thalamus are the place of enlightenment. The word optic means eye. To see. See. Now, let's go back and, and look at the stuff again. It's a, 
Its roof is formed by the vellum interposit. And I don't know how to pronounce all of these things, but you, you, you can read it there. I'm going to do it the best I can. Vellum interpositum. Okay. That's what the roof is. Let's read it again. Its roof is formed by the vellum interpositum. Now, I want you to open the Bible to page 69. And on page 69, look at the book of Exodus. Page 69, look at the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 26 and verse 33, And you shall hang up the veil, that you may bring it inside within the veil, and the veil shall divide between you the holy place and the most holy place. It is the middle curtain. Right. And I want you then to go and look at uh, the same chapter, but look at verse 2. Exodus chapter 26, verse 2. The length of one curtain. Verse 3, the five curtains. And then uh, it talks about, verse 7, you shall make curtains, and the length of one curtain, and curtain, curtain, curtains, and so forth. And then you had that middle curtain in verse 33. What is interesting is when you look at that word, vellum interpositum, okay? The word vellum, and you go look it up, please. The word vellum means curtain. And the word interpositum means middle. The Bible is talking about the curtain that is between the holy and the most holy. And here, in Gray's Anatomy, it's called, a roof is formed by the vellum interpositum, which is the middle curtain. That to me is interesting. I, I, when I see, when I get this stuff, I freak. I throw stuff up there and I go on into Jonas. And I say, I said, come here. I can't come here. I said, come here. I can't come here. I, you got to come here. You got to. Because I'm, 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 I'm not making this. I mean, this is, you, you go look. And that's what it means. In other words, there is an important thing in the Bible about the temple, the tabernacle, which is the curtain in the middle. And Gray's Anatomy talks about the vellum interpositum. You don't care about the vellum interpositum. I don't care about that. But when I heard, it's the curtain in the middle. Wow. I said, what is this? This is great. Then it says, stay with me, from the vellum, the curtain is suspended the choroid plexus of the third. Okay. The, cor the plexus is a nerve. Plexus means nerve. You got this written down? Well, it's not written down anymore. The plexus is nerve. All right? The choroid is the middle coat of the eye. The choroid is the middle coat of the eye. The middle coat of the eye. The center eye of the third ventricle. It is the nerve of the eye in the center of the third ventricle. And then we go to the words of Jesus, which says, if your eye be single, or the eye, the center eye, the middle eye, the third eye, the seat of the soul. But see, that's what it means. The nerve of the middle coat of the eye, the center of the eye, the center eye. Okay? So we put that. Now, in Gray's again, look at the next one. Its floor, somewhat oblique. Huh? Its floor, somewhat oblique. Oblique means slanted, somewhat slanted from before, from the front backward. Somewhat slanted from the front to the back. And that's what it said. Somewhat oblique in its direction, it's formed from before backward. Now, ready? Go to page 70 in the Bible. Look at Exodus chapter 26. 
You got it? Yeah. Look at verse 30. And you shall rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion which we showed you in the mountain. Rear it up. Make it a little bit slanted with the back a little higher than the front. That's what it says in the, in, in, in the anatomy book. All I'm trying to do here is show you all of these things and say, hey, th th this is it. This is the tabernacle. This is, this is the brain. This is what we're talking about. Now, it, the very next word there, it says, by the tuber cinerium. Tuber cinerium is a knob of gray matter, which I would assume raises the floor. Now it goes on after tuber cinerium with its infundibulum and pituitary body. Infundibulum is a funnel which passes through a hole in the center of the pituitary body, which is a master gland. So we see then here the tremendous activity, the tremendous complexity that is in your brain, and there's a little part of it. All of these things established, all of these things working, all of these things there for a tremendous purpose. And it's all going on in the third heaven, in the middle chamber, where God communicates with us from between the wings of the cherubim or seraphim. Okay? Now, the next part of this is, uh, is very interesting, too. Look here at, with its infundibulum and pituitary body, the corpora albicantia. Corpora Albicantia, okay? What's that for? You mean, look at how old are you? How old am I, Donna? How old are you? Do you even know that you have a corpora albicantia? <laughs> you know, would you know if you didn't have any gas in your car? And you would probably know if you didn't have a corpora albicantia. What do you have a corpora albicantia? Hmm. Corpora albicantia means white mass or white body. Can you get there? Can you touch that? Is that important to you? Does it have anything to do with all of this stuff? Do you give a damn whether you have a corpora albicantia or not? Does any of this, I mean, is it, is it a big, I, I went over your head, I mean, Nobody, the, your, the floor is slanted in your brain, the floor is slanted in the temple. No big deal, right? You got a dura mater, pia mater, you got a curtain. The temple's got an outer, inner with a curtain, no big deal. You got a curtain hanging in the middle of the temple, you got a curtain hanging in the middle of your brain, so what, right? Doesn't mean anything. <coughs> Corpora abacantia, this white body. Now, go to page 1003. In Revelation chapter 2, and I, and I don't mean, I was just, I was made a point, I don't mean it's no big deal to you. I know it's a big deal to you. Huh? I'm just, but do you know what you know? Can you, can you look at these people walking down the street who are looking for Noah's Ark? <laughs> Watching Discovery Channel because they found a piece of wood on Mount Ararat or something like that? Yeah. Okay. Revelation chapter 2, you there? Verse 17. He that has an ear, let him hear with the Spirit. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the hidden manna. What's the hidden manna? What's the word manna? Manna, do you have it on your stuff? No. No. All right, quick. I know, we're not, nobody's asking you to memorize all this stuff. It's, it's not necessary to do that. Go to page 4 of your stuff and then share it with somebody. What is manna? Now, what, what's it say here? To those who overcome, I will get to, to give to eat of the hidden manna. Go to page 4 here. What's it say? Manna, the food of the children of Israel, a vegetable from saccharin, manite, manna, sugar. Sugar. Okay? What kind of sugar? Now, go to page, the next page, page 15. What kind of sugar is in your brain? What, it, what kind of brain, what's brain sugar? Look right on page 15. The next says brain sugar is called what? Galactose. Galactose is in your brain. That's the brain sugar. I'm going to give you to eat of the galactose. What are you talking about? What is galact? Go to page six, the next one. Galact is milk. So you have milky sugar. 
Root of the word galactic, pertaining to milk. It's right there. Milky sugar. Oh, I'll let you eat of the hidden manna. Milky sugar. What does the Bible say? I will bring you to a land flowing with milk and honey. The brain. How important is it? And what is the word galactic? Galaxy. What galaxy do you live in? The Milky Way. As it is within, so it is without. Not bad, huh? So far, so good. We're on a roll. Yeah. OK. And, and you, know the, you know the good part of it? You got it there. And not written by me. You got it written by Mr. Grolier and Mr. Gray and Mr. Stedman and all these hotshots that know all this stuff. I don't know all this stuff. OK. So it says here in the Bible, in verse 17 of Revelation 2, I will give you to eat of the hidden manna, the galactose. And what do we talk about? What is corpora abacantia, a white body? I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone. And in the stone, a new name, which no one knows but you. Corpora Abocantia, it's there, waiting for you to take it off the table. Pick it up. The white stone. Pick it up. Hey, I didn't put Corpora Abocantia in there, did I? And I didn't put the white stone in there either. And I didn't put manna in here, and I didn't put manna in there. But you know what they are. And they're here, and they're in there. OK. Now, we got to go back to our brain here. What page were we on? Uh, with 10? OK, go back to page 10 on the stuff. To the, uh, and we look at Gray's again. And it says, after corporea albicantia, the posterior perforated space. It means the rear is spaced, pierced with holes. You know what's so interesting to me about that? OK, I mean, show what's interesting about that. If you, the rear is all spaced with holes, all little holes in the rear. That's what this uh, uh, posterior perforated space means, little holes all through the rear. Now, when I saw that, I realized why something that I think was ridiculous to put in the Bible is in the Bible. Oh, go to page blah, 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 Exodus, where were we? Page uh, 68 again. And look at Exodus 25. Now, you know, you can say I'm reaching, but maybe I am, maybe I'm not, but that's what I have to do. We all have to reach, we have to look at everything. And Albert's a scientist that he knows. I'm sure you've reached for many things that, you know, especially <laughs> Ethel. <laughs> okay. Um, this, is what I, this is what I found. The length, uh, if you look at Exodus chapter 26, go there, and you see the length of one curtain in verse 8. And verse 3, the curtains shall be coupled together, and you shall make loops. And look at verse 5, 50 loops. And it all has to be looped together. And then I thought, well, gee, the loops and the perforations would be very similar. So then there's a reason that they would make loops. See, why not just in the temple, in the Bible, why not just hang them up? Why make the loops? I mean, you know, what's the big deal? If we're out in the desert and there's cats and other things. Why, why do all of this? But there's a reason, because the loops coincide with the posterior perforated spaces, the little holes. All right? OK. Now, if you look at the very next one, and the tegmenta, page 10, page, back to page 10 of the stuff, and the tegmenta of the crura cerebri. And, and this is the uh, leg, long material. And in Exodus channel, uh, verse 26, it talked to us about the long curtains covering the tabernacle or middle cerebrum. Okay? Now, let's go back to the stuff, page 10. Its sides are formed by the optic thalami, and that's the, that's the eye. That's light. That's the eye. The thalami is a gray substance. And it's actually, it's a relay station for sensory stimulus to the cerebrum. Okay? So this relays light to the eye. And Jesus says in Matthew 6, 22, if your eye be single, which is the center eye, your body shall fill with light, which is Christ, so forth. What's interesting about this, what I gave you this morning is the word thalamus has, has various meanings. 
but it means bed, and I, and I want to spend some time in the Song of Songs looking at this because there's a lot of uh, this. But it means bed, it means bedroom, it means chamber. Bridal chamber, bed chamber, and so forth and so on. Uh, in, in the Song of Songs, in, in, in chapter 2, verse 7, it says, my, 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 our bed is green, and, and my lover is asleep, and do not awake him until he chooses. But here now we have all of this stuff. Okay, and you know thalamus means chamber, and it is the solar energy which rises up in through the spine to the brain and goes through all of this stuff and through the ventricle, through the thalamus, through the chambers, and all of this kind of business. What's so interesting to me about this is when you look at page 471, and you have knowing that it's a bedroom or, or bed chamber or bridal chamber um, that I gave you in, in this stuff. If you look at page four, 471, and you look at Psalm chapter 19, okay, and in Psalm chapter, I'm having trouble getting the page here, Psalm chapter 19 and verse 5, verse 4, the line talking about the sun has gone out through all the earth in the end. In them has he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. The thalamus is a chamber. The thalamus is the bedchamber, the bedroom, the bridal chamber. See. Now, it's interesting. Go back to page 10 of the stuff. Its sides are formed by the optic thalami and are limited above by a delicate band of white fibers, the stria pinealis. And the stria pinealis means a straight line to the pineal. Stria pinealis means a straight line to the pineal gland. So the pineal gland now is getting involved here. Look, look what you got. There's a straight line to the pineal gland. Remember, the pineal gland secretes melatonin, which makes you sleep. But the pineal gland is how important? Let me show you. Page 28 of the Bible, for, for those of you who haven't seen it before. See? Now, what, what are you doing now? Right now, you're just learning. We're sitting in a, in, and we're learning together what's going on in there. We're learning together the Bible and the anatomy books are talking about the same thing. And then once you understand it, once you learn it, then you start to implement it, and then the stone rolls away, and so forth. Genesis chapter 32, where you're at. Genesis chapter 32. And look at verse 30. Genesis chapter 32, verse 30. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. You want to see him face to face, you know where to go. And guess what? you got a straight line to the penny. A straight line connected to the penny. How do you know it? Because it says it in the anatomy book that you've got. Stria pinealis, a straight line to the penny. Okay? Now, the straight line to the penny, watch this, which runs along the junction of the mesial, which is the middle, and upper surfaces of the optic thalamus, the light, the bedroom, the pineal chamber. Okay? Now, shh. Of course, we get to the place where the stone is. We get to the place where your love is sleeping. We get to the place where the child is born. We get to the place where one day inside of you the stone will roll away. The straight line for the pineal runs along the junction of the mesial and upper surfaces of the optic thalamus to join the anterior, okay, which is the front pillars of the fornix, the pillars of the temple, the pillars of the tabernacle. The vault 
or the one that you've looked for all of your life called God dwells in the secret place. Okay? Now, the fornix, which I have shown you on other occasions, okay, uh, in, in Rome it was a, it's, it's a fortified arch. Um, it uh, was actually fort, fornicatris, the city arch, the Romans, the left and right. So we have the fornix. We have the left and right thalamus, which were the bridal chambers. We have the hypothalamus, which is under the bride's room, which is very consistent, incidentally, with the pyramid, where you have the king's chamber, and then you have the queen's chamber underneath, which would be the hypothalamus, and that's very, very consistent, OK? Uh, now, the word fornix, which you see there, According to Webster, and I've got it for you somewhere in here. I'm not. I if I, uh, we'll find, yes, if you look on page 14 of your stuff, you see the last what I words I have underlined there: fornix, a vault-like space. I don't know how many of you, how many of you ever had Catholic church experience? Okay, the Catholic church experience, you, you remember the priest goes up to the altar and he has this thing covered and he pulls the drapes back and then he has a key and he opens it and he opens this little door and then he reaches in and he takes this out, takes out the hose from this vault-like space, which is the fornix. It is the hidden place. According to Webster, it is a place where valuables are kept. It is a hidden place. We had the pillars of the fornix. And I, I found this particular scripture to be interesting on page 67 in Exodus chapter 24. And in Exodus chapter 24, in verse 4, it said, And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and 12 pillars, according to the 12 tribes. And under the hill, the place where the valuables are kept, the hidden place. And here the vault is buried, or there are pill pillars. Now, if you look on page 10 of this stuff again, okay, It says the ventricle, down about the center of where we're at, the ventricle is bounded in front by the interior pillars of the fornix. In other words, these are the pillars of the temple. These are the pillars of the temple. And the lamina, what says lamina cinerea, which are folds of nerve tissue behind by the pineal gland, okay? by the pineal gland, which is what Jesus talked about. If your eye be single, your body will fill with light. And then it talks about posterior commissure, which is crisscrossing white matter, which is also by the pineal gland. And it says then, the, if we go to the next page, page 11, at its upper and anterior part, immediately behind the anterior pillars of the fornix in front of the thalamus is an opening. Now, this is the point, okay? We, we've seen all of this going on, the anatomy, the inner brain between the wings of the cerebrum, and all of this kind of business. We realize that the inner brain is the covered place. It's the point where the Christ energy must go. And we found out earlier that it's only the Christ energy that can use us. It is only the Christ energy that can go there. We looked at the middle chamber. Remember, the very first thing we looked at in 1 Kings 6, 8 is the energy goes into the middle chamber. And the fornix is located directly in the middle. It is directly in the center. It is the middle vault. In other words, it's a vault. It's a place with something sacred, something powerful, 
something so valuable is kept. And it's inside of you. It's inside of your head. And, and it says in Ezekiel 40, the steps went up and there were pillars by the post and on this side and another on that side. And the, this fortex has front pillars. And the fortex has front pillars with a straight line to what we read there that goes to the pineal gland. How important is it then for your meditation where that solar energy rises up and impacts the pineal gland? What's so important about that? What's the big deal about that? Well, we just learned that the pineal gland has a straight line which goes to the vault where that special, holy, secret, wonderful, powerful stuff is kept within you. Wait, and when enough energy hits, what caused this energy? What caused the energy to make the stone roll away so Jesus comes out in this myth? What made it happen? It was the power of the angel. The angel rolled the stone away. Don't you understand what's being said to you? The angle of the electromagnetic field, the energy, the angle that hits this fornix causes the stone to roll away, and the power that is within that fornix, which is the power that the God creator placed in there for you to find, will burst forth and come out. Okay. How important is that? There is an opening on either side so that the third ventricle, look, look what it says, the third ventricle can communicate. So in other words, that the fornix, this holy place, has an opening on either side so that the third ventricle can communicate with the ventricle on the other side. So there can be communication on both sides. But who is it for? This is about the solar energy, the sun energy. And we're going to wrap this up here with this, but this I want to share with you. Now, we talk about Jesus, whatever. Now, don't do anything else. Don't go anywhere for just a minute. Because this fornix, this vault, it's just like in the Catholic Church. Nobody can open that but the high priest. But in this particular case, inside of your brain, there's only one high priest. That's that solar energy that we call Jesus. Only one entity can go in there. You can meditate to the cows come home. You can read every book by Swami Bhagwan. You can read any book by, by whomever in, in, in any religion, Christianity, the Pope, anybody. Nobody on the face of the earth can open that door. It's sealed. Nobody. There is an opening that is not big enough for you. There are cherubims around there with fire, you know, like it says, so keep you and me out. So we can't go. What can you do then in order to activate this so the energy can move outward from the fornic? Get out of the way. Get out of the way. Be still. Stop. Shut down. Because when you got all of the stuff going through your brain and your mind, nothing happens here. It can't. Because all the energy is consumed over here on the left side where we're going to solve everything, or we're going to go to church, or we're going to learn how to meditate. We're going to do all this crap. We're going to do nothing. But when we shut it down, and there is nothing but pure energy, then it can start to move here. Then the straight line from the pineal gland can start hammering away and start moving the stone. Now, this Jesus who said at that, look, let, let, let's put it in perspective so we know what we're talking about, okay? Uh, page 1004. Page 1004, Revelation chapter 3, and then we'll go. Revelation chapter 3. Well, let's, let's look at this real carefully, and then we'll wrap it up. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans, write, These things say the Amen. Who said it? Amen. Amen is the name of the ram had Egyptian sun god, which coordinates with Aries. But Amen is the name of the sun. Okay, so Jesus, whatever. I, I, I don't care. What you're it's the solar. Why the sun god? Because it is the solar energy in you that must go up to hit the pineal gland. It triggers the pineal to send the message through the stria pinealis, the straight line to the fornix. All right. So, amen the sun god. Now let's look at this Jesus guy. 
because we got to get the energy up the spine to the pineal through all this kind of business. So is amen involved in that? Let's go and see. Page 880, real quick. John chapter 14. Then don't you understand what's happening to you? Don't you understand you're given instructions about all this and what happens and how to work it, how to operate it, what's going to happen, and then you're going to find out what's going to happen, who's going to be standing there when, this roll, when the stone rolls away. Remember when there was an angel standing there when the stone rolled away? Remember when the lady came and said, where is he? I don't know where he is. And the angel said, well, what are you looking for, the living and the dead for? Do you want to meet that guy? Because he'll be standing there waiting for you. I'm telling you the truth. I, have, I, told you any, I haven't told you any baloney. That's one thing I can't document yet, but I will. <laughs> okay. And so, John chapter 14. Just do this with me. Look at verse 20. This is what Jesus says. At that day, you shall know, I am in my Father, you and me, and I in you. Whoa. He says he's amen. He said he's in you. What did he say his name was? Amen. You read it in the Bible, right? Thus saith he amen. And he says amen is in you. Okay? So this passageway that goes through the fornix, that can communicate to the ventricles, that can communicate information, to communicate all this stuff through your head. Read with me page 11 of the stuff I gave you. At its upper and interior part, immediately behind the anterior pillars of the fornix, and in front of the optic thalamus, is an opening. What's it for? For amen. Read it! Read it. What's it for? For amen. Why couldn't it be for, sh for, 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 for Charlie Chan? Why couldn't it be for, for Beatrice? Why couldn't it be for any name in the any name of all the names in the world? What's it say? Is it, the guy named Monroe is the guy who discovered it. Don't worry about Monroe, all right? <laughs> he didn't have nothing to do with this. What's this for? It says right on page 11, it is for Amen, by which this ventricle communicates with the lateral ventricle on either side. In other words, every opening in your body where there is communication crisscrossing in this great electrical part so is called, it's reserved for amen. What did he call himself in the Bible? Amen. What did he say? I'm in you. Sure you are. Because it says so in the anatomy book. Amen is in me. And this is for amen. I mean, I did not write this. I couldn't have written it any better if I wanted to. Can you imagine I was running around when I found this when I told I says, you're not going to I said, sit down. You're not going to believe it. You are not going to believe it. They're going to think I made this up. But you know it because you've got it in your little hand. Close it for, for amen, by which this ventricle communicates with either ventricle on either side. Coincidence left there by someone to be found sometime. Like the word OM. This is for Amen to communicate. Amen. I am in you. Who is in you? Amen. And for what reason? For Amen is in your brain in the third. Right? This is for third ventricle, isn't it? It says it here. It's for Amen. Do you remember what Paul said? He saw Jesus, didn't he? Where was he taken? To the third. That's what it said. Do you remember reading that? Where Paul says, whether out of the body or in the body, I don't know. Translated to the third heaven and I saw Jesus. Well, Jesus is amen. For amen, which travels through the third ventricle. Do, am I getting anywhere? Do you, do you want to hear what I'm saying? So now we will consider the anatomical working that moves Christ to this place and moves all of this stuff around, and we'll do that. Next. This? This is heavy stuff. But you know what's so beautiful about it? There is not one bit of it that is beyond your ability to understand what we've talked about. It's no big deal. It's just a route by which energy flows. And you had a description today from the Bible, that coincided with scientific explanation of how all this stuff works. And it's just like your first day when somebody, when your father or your mom or whomever sat down with you and started to explain how to drive a car. 
And then you couldn't wait until you could get in and get your hands on that wheel. But see, now there'll be an opportunity because now you're starting to understand how this works so that when you start doing this and you know before you go in that you just have to get out of the way so that four amen can start moving through the various things in your brain and start all of this happening. You'll realize now, remember what we got? Start in the, the genital area, raises up through the solar plexus where it picks up the solar energy. Now we know it goes up with winding stairs, hits the pineal, and there's a straight line from the pineal to the fornix. And there's nothing that you or I or any teacher or any priest or pope or anybody else can do anything about. This is off limits to everybody. All we have to do is get out of the way and allow it to happen. So, I would die before anybody could tell me that this is not what this means. Because it is what it means. And the best is yet to come. <laughs> but, you, you know, I sometimes think, I, I said to Albert when we were doing Pegasus, I said, geez, what can we do with it? And you know what's going to happen? You know what's so exciting about this? This and Pegasus are going to come right back together. So we're going to come back together for you. So we've got, we still have some things to do, but what you need to do now is when you go into your meditation, look at this stuff again, if you listen to the tapes again, or whatever you do. Those of you who want copies of this stuff, of course, eight, I gotta, you know, people are gonna get mad because we lost money last year, so you, you could help with that, you know. But, um, of course, eight cents, well, how many pages are there? 